This is Charles C. W. Cook, actual British person. Many have asked National Review, you seafaring magazine, will you finally sail the Atlantic? Our answer: yes, emphatically. Join us August 31st to September 7th aboard Cunard Line's spectacular Queen Mary II on NR's 2017 transatlantic crossing. This affordable once-in-a-lifetime experience on many a bucket list sails from England to New York. On board will be conservative stars including Tom Coburn, Michael Mukasey, Mark Helprin, Rich Lowry, Douglas Murray, ricochet regulars like Rob, Jonah, Jay, James, fellow Mad Dog Kevin, and many more. You know you want to come. Do it. Visit nrcruise.com to get complete information or call 888-283-8965. Every Ricochet member who signs up will get a $50 cabin credit. See you on board. Hello and welcome to Q and A. I'm Jay Nordlinger, and this podcast is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. I'll have more to say about them later in the show. Our guest today is Ben Shapiro. He's the editor in chief of the Daily Wire. He grew up in L.A. He went to UCLA and then to Harvard Law School. He's the author of several books and is altogether. One of the most prominent conservative journalists in America, Ben. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. So I saw the movie La La Land. Is that what your hometown is like? It it, it seemed awfully glamorous. I wanted to move there immediately. Well, I mean, it, it was much cleaner in the movie. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty <laughs> dirty, actually. Was <laughs> as a city. They show all the nice parts of L.A. Uh, even the parts that are kind of sketchy in the in the film. That would that would be like top notch L.A. That would be that would be you know the the stuff that. That goes for a million dollars a house, and uh, all the all the streets. Apparently, that was the one time they'd cleaned them. Was right after they'd right before they'd filmed it. So, yeah, it's uh, also people don't randomly break into break into song. It's it's more likely that they randomly break into screaming at each other because they're being stabbed by a homeless person or something. So it seemed, it seemed like uh, it seemed like a nice place, and not not the place where I live, but it seemed like a nice place. bummer. So deflating, but the UCLA campus is beautiful, is it not? Oh yeah, UCLA is actually really nice. Yeah. Uh, the Daily Wire. I, I never know. I don't know what terms to use for journalism anymore. I don't really say newspaper. Uh, website. Yeah, uh, website. That, that seems too generic and weak. Um, it's. Yeah, I would say it's. It's an opinion journalism media outlet, which makes it sound a lot more shockingly glamorous than it is. So, um, <laughs> but it's. But yeah, I mean, what, the, that Daily Wire is the website, and we are. Uh, I would say uh, an upper level, mid major website. We have. Something around the range of twenty-five to to thirty million page views a month. I like the idea of a wire. That's an old term in journalism, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's that's why we picked it. So I still have a tendency to to enjoy the old terminology. Ben, um, how did you get to be a conservative? Were you born that way? Did events shape you, or something you read, or or what? Uh well, I mean, I, I grew up in a conservative house. So my, my parents were both Reagan Republicans. Uh, the, the last time either one of them voted for a Democrat was Carter in 76. Uh, and it was a religious Jewish household. So we became fully Orthodox when I was 11. Uh, and it, the, the overlap between religious Jews and, and conservatives is very, very high. So while there's this widespread public perception that all Jews are to the left, that's only Jews that aren't actually observant. Observant Jews vote about 75, 25 Republican. Mm -hmm. And... Ben, were you a bit of an odd duck on the UCLA campus in a religious minority and a political minority, or as I think they said in a movie, did you blend? I, I definitely did not blend. Uh, I was I was always trouble. Uh, I, <laughs> I was the I was the only conservative columnist on the newspaper, and it was it was the most widely read column on the paper because I had a monopoly basically. But it was uh, yeah, it was it was always fun. I I enjoy being in in lefty areas because I enjoy the conversation, I enjoy the discussion, and so I would I always had good experiences at UCLA. You know, I also knew enough to know that when it came to professors, uh, the, the the best thing to do, and I still give this advice to college students, is try and gauge whether the professor is going to grade you down for your views. Say anything you want in class, but then when it comes time for you to actually do your test, write what the professor wants you to write because. It's not worth sacrificing a grade just to tick off the professor. Such a shame. 
such a shame that that even comes up, but I understand very well. Uh, you, my impression is that you visit a lot of campuses today, I mean, in your career. Oh, yeah. And many more campuses than I do. Uh, do you find that people are happy to see you <laughs> and the con conservatives are kind of gratified and even some people on the left are sort of curious and at least hospitable or yeah, not? Yeah, 100%. No, I, I do think that's the case. It really depends on the campus. I think there's, there's a kind of a, a fringe group that is really unhappy about it. And it varies in size from campus to campus. At Penn State, for example, there was a, there was a protest that elevated to them trying to break down the doors while I was speaking at Cal State LA. There was a near riot where they had to call out the, the police and, and there were helicopters and I had to be escorted on and off campus by an armed contingent of about 20 cops. But that's a rarity. I speak at 25 to 30 campuses a year. And like this week, I'm doing two of them. We don't expect there to be any problems. It's usually uh, a packed house, usually with, with standing room over, overflow. And the vast majority of people who show up are conservative, but I, I really enjoy it when, when people on the left come. I always give them first priority when it comes to asking questions. I, they, I say that they get to go to the front of the line because it's more interesting to have those conversations than to talk about what we agree about. So uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's, it's interesting because I've sort of been caught in the, the uh, I would say, the, the overflow of rage on campus. Uh, but it's, it's definitely bizarre to me because... I've actually never had a, a run-in with somebody on the left that's really brutal, uh, except for you know some of these near riots and protests that are usually coming from kids who I, I, pro I have to imagine they have no idea who I am, and they've never read anything I've said. It's just their professors have been telling them that some member of the KKK is coming, and they assume yeah, that, uh, that I, I must – yeah, exactly. I, I must be that guy. So you know, I, go, I go to University of Wisconsin, and they call me – a, uh, and, and they call me a KKK member and a white supremacist, and I'm standing there in my yarmulke, and it's kind of weird. <laughs> I, I think of a great phrase from, from long ago from Ed Banfield, rioting for fun and profit. Yeah, exactly. I, I, th <laughs> I think we saw some of that at Berkeley recently. Yeah, and I think it was for uh, Milo's fun and Milo's profit probably, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Um, I, I often say, Ben, that I don't know what to – read today uh, for journalism. Things are so confusing, and everyone has his own media. As they say, everyone curates his own media. They're reading separate things, outlets belonging to their, uh, outlets belonging to their tribe. And um, it would be nice if we had uh, sort of common places to go to, and we could agree on certain facts before we started expressing our opinions and, and arguing. It, it's a wonderful and rich media environment, but, but I find it confusing. Let me cite something in particular. I, uh, for years and years, people like me, people like us, have uh, inveighed against the so-called MSM, the mainstream media. And sometimes I think <laughs> – I sometimes think that, that conservatives have taught people too well – because, for example, when I'll cite a story from, let's say, the New York Times or the Washington Post, someone will say on tw Twitter, ah, you've linked to the Post. Epic fail. Yep. So yep. If, if they don't see it uh, uh, on the Drudge Report or at Breitbart or from Fox News, it doesn't exist. And I, I'm not sure how to navigate an environment such as this. I've been rambling for a minute, so let me just have you respond in any way I mean, you I think that's I think that's totally true. And I, I've been spending an awful lot of time thinking about this lately because I feel like we're now living in a fact-free environment where if you read the Huffington Post, you get one set of facts. And if you hear, if you read Breitbart, you get a different set of facts. And it really isn't a different set of opinions about the same facts. They're legitimately different facts. And both sides are actually determining that the, the facts the other side are bringing must, just by the nature of the person who's bringing them, be ruled out of order. That's, a, that's actually a pretty dangerous environment, and, and that, that's reinforced by social media where Facebook has algorithms that are going to direct you to the, the media like the ones that you've already liked. So if you like a story from Breitbart, you're probably going to get a story from Breitbart or The Daily Caller. You're not going to get a story from Huffington Post. And so what I've sort of determined is that, number one, I think that the, the idea of a media outlet being reliable is sort of overblown now because every reporter has such resources at his or her disposal – that you can, there, there are certain reporters that you can rely on and certain ones that you can't because there are certain reporters who seem to care much more about the truth than others. So, you know, for example, at CNN, you know, I, I wouldn't trust a, a lot that comes out of, out of Christiane Amanpour's mouth, but I trust a fair bit that comes out of Jake Tapper's mouth. They're two very different reporters from the same network. If I cite something from CNN, is it necessarily false just because CNN has a left-leaning bias? Uh, or is it possible the facts are true and the narrative is false? And the, the problem is this, it is interesting. You remember when BuzzFeed put out that, that dossier that they had not vetted, they had not bothered to vet. 
And yeah. the dossier, the, their excuse was, now you can go verify it yourself. And most people looked at that and said, what, are you crazy? Like, none of us have sources in Russia. It's not our job to go verify it ourselves. But to a certain extent, that's where we are in the media landscape, and it's not totally false. In, in the media landscape, everybody sort of is tasked with doing that now, determining what's true and what's false. And so I think that a, a pretty good rule of thumb, and it's made it difficult because of social media and the emphasis that, that exists on speed. If you're the first person to tweet something clever, you get 2,000 retweets. If you're the second person, you get 10. So there's a lot of focus <laughs> on, on speed. But th- there is something to be said for the idea that better to be the second person reporting something after it's verified than the first person to report it and get it wrong. And so give it gives everything a few hours to settle out before immediately assuming they're true, or at least search the headline online to determine whether there's a second side of the story that's not being told yet. I also think that it's, we're, we've now entered this sort of uh, poisonous cycle where the right says that the media on the left are false, and the left immediately says, okay, well, the right is lying about us. And so the left begins running more and more hysterical hit pieces against people on the right with worse and worse vetting, which, yeah. of course, only creates more animus from the right, which, of course, only creates more animus from the left. And so, you know, I, I have so I have sort of my own rule of, rules of thumb. Number one, as far as who to trust, one is, are they cautious about being the first one out there? Like, do they care more about accuracy than being the first one out there? And number two, I would say is, how quick are they to retract a story if it turns out not to be true? Are they quick to retract it, or do they try and double down on it as much as possible and try and say that it's true even when it's false? And does the story invariably back one side? If the story invariably backs one side, then... I have a feeling the outlet is is pretty is pretty bad, and and that's why useless. You know, yeah, that, that's why I, I've become not a fan of the site that I used to work for, Breitbart, because I think that they don't really bother to to run an antagonistic side toward toward Trump. It's a, the entire thing is just what did Trump do that's great today, and that doesn't mean that what they're saying about Trump isn't true sometimes, but it does mean that you sort of have to take everything with more of a grain of salt than you would if you saw it at at a place that that tends to try and speak more even handedly on this. Ben, do you know what I'm feeling lately a little bit guilty about? I feel like I'm speaking to a therapist. Uh, for <laughs> years and years, you know, in my columns and elsewhere, I've said, well, let's look at this stupid thing published in the Washington Post, this silly article or silly comment, or in the New York Times, or, or this stupid thing from CBS Evening News, let's say. But what I never say is there were 70 other things in the Washington Post today that were very good and from which one could learn. Never. I never say yeah. that. Yeah, no, that's, so, I think that's true. So, for, for example, j- just recently, you, I think the Washington, I believe it was a photo caption. Uh, remember it said something like the anti-intellectual David Galerner or something yep. like that? Yep. yep. And yep. we all wrote about it. We spent a couple of days on it, right, or maybe a week. I believe it was a photo caption. And there were 70 other things in the Washington Post that day uh, that were uh, rewarding, true and rewarding and right. And I never say so. And I just think, you know, what if people, what if people like me or my counterparts did that with, let's say, National Review? You can find something stupid at National Review online every day, I'm pretty sure, and highlight it and, and sort of stigmatize us with it. So this is the kind of thing that's been on my mind lately. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's right. It's, it's also part of that is due to the, the nature of, of legacy media that doesn't exist in National Review. So National Review, here's the thing. In National Review or Daily Wire, everybody's got a byline. So yeah. it's so like I run Daily Wire. So if somebody has a serious problem with Daily Wire, it's either going to be with me directly or it's going to be with a columnist who's got their name on something. And at National Review, if I don't like something by Victor Davis Hanson, you know, which happens sometimes now that he's very much in Trump's camp, then I can say I don't like that piece by Victor Davis Hanson, and I can be critical of the piece by Victor Davis Hanson. You know, the National Review did take it on the chin when they ran that against Trump issue, right? Because that was mm-hmm. considered sort of the entire National Review board coming to coming to bear. But the Washington Post, because and, we, and and of course we were we were praised and thanked for it as well by others. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. And, and and but you know, for the people who do, we're talking sort of the the antagonistic point of view, oh, people didn't like it. They were they were ripping the, the entire the entire board of National Review. Part of that is because National Review is, doesn't pretend to be an objective news source. I think that if the Washington Post were to come out and say, "Look, we're not an objective news source, right? We're we're going to report yes. stuff, and a lot of it's going to be true." But You're that's my song, yeah, right. But but if but only the New York Times stuff. would say, "Look, we are a great." liberal or left of center newspaper. Exactly. exactly. Maybe the best in the whole English language. I'd be fine. That, yeah. uh, so would I. So would it's I. A pre- this is why, the pretense is what's bad. How, yeah. Right. How much time do conservatives, and here's the way you can tell, how much time do conservatives spend ripping on Salon.com or Slate as opposed, you know, we make fun of them, but how much time do we spend really savaging them as opposed to the New York Times or Washington Post? 
How much time do we spend ripping into MSNBC as opposed to CNN? We spend a lot more time on CNN than MSNBC, and that's because everybody knows MSNBC is a lefty network. And so it's, it's, it's the lack of honesty and, and, the, and the prior warning. So, you know, it's, as I say, everybody knows where National Review stands politically. It doesn't make any great secret of that. I don't spend any time trying to debunk headlines at the, at the Huffington Post. What's the point? We all know what the Huffington Post is. It's pretty clear about what it is. So the, it's, it's that, it's, it's the, but, but by the same token, what's happened is the left made the mistake of portraying left-wing reporting as objective reporting. And then the right made the mistake of saying that all leftist reporting is false. And so that's, and, and that's, that's taking it one step too far. And that's, that's where we are now is these dueling narratives where people just say things that are blatantly false on both sides of the aisle and their own side of the aisle believes them. So a plurality of Republicans now think that Donald Trump had an inauguration crowd that was bigger than Barack Obama's. And mm-hmm. I, I'm sure a majority of Democrats believe that Donald Trump actually imposed a Muslim ban, even though his executive order is nothing of the sort. So everybody is sort of believing what they want to believe on their particular side of the aisle. And that gives the feeling that everybody's lying to you. You're yeah. constantly getting yeah, the yeah. feeling that everybody's, and that makes people paranoid. And it makes people angry. And it makes people feel like they're being cheated. It makes them feel like conspiracies are out there to, to target the people they like and to, and to you know, elevate the people that they hate. And it, it, the polarization of the media climate is really terrible. And, and again, I think that's reinforced by the fact that we follow the people we like on Twitter. I don't know how many people on the left you follow on Twitter. I tend to follow a lot of objective reporters. Almost and nobody. Right, I, I, follow, yeah. I, I follow a lot of people from kind of Washington Post, Politico, and then I follow some people on my own side. But I don't tend to follow a lot of people who are on the, the, the uh, open left. No. Uh, and I think the same thing is true on Facebook for people, where we're being drawn into these, these smaller and smaller cloisters. And the Internet makes that more available to us, that you're going to associate with people who are more like you, and you're going to be recommended to, to do that, because if you're now at, like, the Daily Wire, just to get kind of deep into the weeds here for a second, if you're now at, like, the Daily Wire, and we have a Facebook page, or I have a personal Facebook page, I have an interest in supplying the readers to my Facebook page stuff that they want to click on, because I want to grow my Facebook page. And so this leads to an environment where if you don't have people who really care about truth, the easiest thing in the world is to just start shilling for one side or the other, or to just start chilling for a particular candidate. I mean, look, one of the, I think one of the great lies of this election cycle is that the people who were anti-Trump, conservatives who were anti-Trump, did it for the pay. I, thought, I think it's the most absurd contention I've ever heard in my life. The people who did it for the pay... It was a heck of a risk. It was a professional the, the, risk. The, the people who did it for the pay were clearly the people who are in favor of Trump. I mean, look, yeah. when's the last, I mean, look, look at Breitbart's traffic. Breitbart's traffic, according to their own measures, went from you know, 30 or 40 million page views a month, maybe 50 million page views a month, to 200 million page views a month almost solely on the back of riding the Trump train. So there, there are a number of people who are on TV now all the time because they were part of the Trump train. Look, that's, I'm not going to say that everybody who's doing that is doing that for the money, but by the same token, if you're going to accuse somebody of doing it for the money, you have to show how they actually benefited from doing something. Ben, do you, do you know people who will criticize Trump off the air but not on? 100%, yes. I, I know Isn't many, that many weird? Them. Isn't that weird? Because we're, you know, we're not politicians. It's bad enough when politicians are like that. We're journalists and, and writers. I, it, it's just, um, it ought not to be, to borrow yeah, an old but, line. Well, but we're scared. Of, I mean, I think everybody is scared of the consumer. And that's, you know, that, that, that's the problem with art and news when it comes to the markets. And markets are, are a wonderful thing. I, I love markets. But yes. just because Lady Gaga sells a bajillion records doesn't mean she's Beethoven. Yes. And just because people listen to Alex Jones doesn't mean that Alex Jones has anything of, of true value to say. So yeah. it's, it, it, this, is, this is the danger. In an area where you're trying to inculcate virtue or truth, the market does not always cater to virtue and truth. So, I mean, not only do I know people who, who do that, I know people who, are, who, who were convinced by their companies, who were told by their companies that they had to toe the line or they would be in danger of losing their jobs. And yep. that's, that's dangerous stuff. I mean, I, I, I speak from firsthand knowledge on that one. So it's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really negative, and it's going to be up to the American people, I think, at a certain point to say, I'm so sick of the polarized atmosphere that I'm willing to, to hear truth no matter where I get it. I mean, honestly, the only thing that I can say, oh, this is very downbeat, the only thing that I can say that, that I think uh, is, is a good thing is that I, I really, personally, I try to make an attempt to, to – try and call balls and strikes and call it yeah. as I see it. And so on my own podcast, uh, I do, for example, a thing called Good Trump, Bad Trump. And we have a jingle, and I try to say, here's what Trump did that was good today, here's what Trump did that was bad today. And our audience has been incredibly, uh, incredibly, um, it, it's grown incredibly. When we started off a year and a half ago, we had 3,000 listeners a day. Now we have an excess of 300,000 listeners a day. So and our website didn't exist a year and a half ago. Now it has 30 million page views a month in, on that order. So it's, I think that there, isn't, there is an audience for this. And I think that as time goes on, 
And as people become disillusioned with the idea that lying for, for fun and profit is, is the way to do this, there will be a, a reversion to a desire for truth. I, I think you're starting to see that a little bit, but really? it'll take a while. I, I find that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fear in our camp, Ben. Fear of uh, readers, listeners, viewers, donors, TV appearances, speaking appearances, that sort of thing. And um, it's, it's sort of pathetic to see journalists who are supposed to be, you know, no fear or favor types, trembling. It's so odd. It, 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 it's odd, except for the fact that the ground has completely shifted. I, I was talking about this on my podcast today that I feel like I said this to me, even in my, it's very troubling. I mean, I, I know I can sense that you're troubled by it. I'm really troubled by it um, because you spend your entire career thinking that you're part of a broad ideological movement. And then you realize that the broad ideological movement's like seven people, <laughs> right? That it's, it's people who you personally know and have on your, and have on your speed dial. And yeah. maybe half of those people are new because half of the people who were on your speed dial are gone now. And yeah. w- what, what happened before is, there was sort of a, a view in politics on the right, anyway. I, I'm not as troubled by the left. The, le- the left, I can fully predict, I fully understand. The left is the left. They are what they are. What yeah. I'm troubled by on our side of the aisle is this idea that victory somehow alleviates the moral burden. So yeah. it doesn't matter if you lie. It doesn't matter if you're a bad person. It doesn't matter if you're decent. All that matters is that you win. And there's this halo effect that, that accrues to winning that allows you to escape moral culpability for doing bad things. And this is really upsetting to me because as somebody who believes that politics is intertwined with morality, the idea that I'm going to be okay with, for example, President Trump saying that we're just like Vladimir Putin because I like his policy on tax cuts, that's asinine to me. That's, how do, that, that doesn't compute. One thing does not make the other okay. But what, what I'm seeing is um, it used to be the politics on our side of the aisle was on one axis. It was left versus right. It was, you, and there was gradations to that, but you had the left, and then you had a bunch of in between, and then you had the right. And now, if you think of that as the x-axis, now there's been an, a y-axis that's been added to politics, and that is Trump, pro-Trump versus anti-Trump, because there's a cult of personality that's been built up around victory. And so yeah. there are some people who are, who are you know, like you or like me where I don't want to exist on the y-axis. I don't care about the y-axis. It doesn't make any difference to me. Trump is not an important person to me. Trump is just a person. And so if he does something good, then great. And if he does something bad, then that sucks. That's, that's bad. I don't like that. <laughs> but it means that, I'm, that means that if you are somebody who sees the y-axis, and not just the x-axis, not just the right-left axis, but the Trump versus anti-Trump axis, what that means is that suddenly I'm now a moderate. I'm now a wishy-washy person, right? Because, yep. because I'm, at, I'm at the zero point on the y-axis. I'm at zero. I'm not up I, with Trump and I'm not down against Trump. I'm just, I'm at zero. And if I drift down against Trump, then suddenly I'm in bad territory because I'm in, I'm in a different quadrant. The people they like, the people that a lot of folks on our aisle, uh, uh, on our side of the aisle like, they like Mike Pence because Mike Pence is on the right. He's on, on that ac- right, left axis. He's on the right, but he's also all the way at the top on that y-axis because he's on the right, but he is willing to back any silly thing that Donald Trump says or does. And I think this is going to be, I think this is going to be tenable for about two months, because I think that, that at a certain point, I don't know. Donald, the, at a certain point, Donald Trump. When I say tenable, I mean logically tenable, not emotionally tenable. I think this ah. could last for years, right? I think yeah, 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 this, yeah. this yeah. could, but I mean logically tenable because Donald, because Mike Pence can say, "I'm all the way to the right, but I'm also really super tr- pro Trump," for as long as Donald Trump is pushing Judge Gorsuch. But the minute that Donald Trump starts pushing trillion-dollar infrastructure packages, it's a little bit tougher. He's going to have to move to the left on that right-left spectrum in order or, to continue to be at the top of that Y spectrum. How about equating the United States with Putin's Russia? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Perfect this example. Not I mean, I, yeah, I, I looked at that the other day, and, I, and, and again, I, I saw glimmers of that during the, during the election. I mean, I, I was actually if, if a left wing by the VP debate. If a right? left-wing figure had said that, we would talk about nothing else for a month. It's, it's Noam Chomsky stuff. It's Noam Chomsky yeah. stuff. I actually just wrote more. Yeah. I actually just wrote a piece for uh, for National Review actually about um about this this crisis of conscience that's happening inside kind of conservative intelligentsia because there's so many people who want to find what's this nexus point between trumpism and conservatism and philosophically there really is not one and this is sort of the problem and it's it, it there 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 may be positional commonalities but positional commonalities does not mean intellectual nexus I have a lot of posi- like Donald Trump has positions in common with Bernie Sanders. It doesn't mean they're ideologically aligned. And I, I, I'm sure you read that piece by Rich Lowry and Rich Lowry and Ramesh Panuru about nationalism and the attempt to pour the the wine of of creedal nationalism into the into the vessel of Trumpian European style blood and soil nationalism. I think this is a huge mistake, and I think that that's an impossibility too. But 
there's this struggle now to say, okay, well, you know, Trump's in, Trump's in charge. We, we're either going to be on the train or trying to direct the train or we're going to get run over. And my feeling is that it's not about the levers of power anymore. Now it's about just pure intellectual honesty. Because if we're, if we're fighting for the soul of a movement or if we're fighting for something that's true, then I care a lot less about the policy and I care much more about the future of an ideological movement if there's going to be one. Because you can cut taxes as much as you want. You can, you can do all of, all of the various things that, that you want policy-wise. But if that means that you have a president who, if that means that your movement is basically now blood and soil nationalism as opposed to creedal nationalism based on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, I, uh, that's not America anymore. It's, it's a country that has policies that I like, but it's not America. Ladies and gentlemen, we're listening to Ben Shapiro, the editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire. We'll be back after a word from our sponsor. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 1 million businesses. And right now, Q&A listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash free trial. And of course, free trial is one word. That's ZipRecruiter, also one word, dot com slash free trial. Bear with it one more time. It'll be worth it. ZipRecruiter.com slash free trial. Thank you and happy hiring. I'm Jay Nordlinger with Q&A. And we are talking with Ben Shapiro of The Daily Wire. Ben, for many years, we've knocked the left, mocked the left for its conformity and the great pressures to conform on the left. I find that the, the right has the same tendency or gives into the same temptation. I, I, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the home, we're, 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 the, we're the base of individualism, right? Got to be yourself. Uh, the pressures to conform are enormous on the right, uh, proving that I guess that we're just all human. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. It takes it, it takes a lot of wherewithal and self awareness to say that you're willing to to allow dissenting points of view, even if it means you lose. <laughs> and I think that and I, I think that what I realized about this election cycle uh, during the election cycle is that. For all the people who claim that they're pro liberty and pro and pro freedom and pro individual dissent and all of this stuff, pretty much everybody on the inside is a little bit fascist, and that's, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. not which, which is a pretty disquieting yeah. notion. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's true. I think that everybody a true, on the inside a truly, a truly liberal democratic uh, soul, I think, is a rather rare thing. Yeah, I, I think everybody on the inside is fine with fascism so long as it's the fascist of their choice. So, Absolutely. so right now, they they're very uh, they're okay with things that. It, I, I, on, on my podcast, I actually have, it's a video podcast. So I actually bring a shoe to the set and I hold up the shoe and I say, I want you to put the shoe on the other foot because mm -hmm. it